I'm Frank Pinello, the owner and operator of Best Pizza here in Waynesburg, Brooklyn. And you are now watching the Growing Up Italian Podcast. Boom, boom, boom. a sudden he's there for five days and he's the boss of a kid that's been there for 10 years yeah bro that's exactly it it's weird so now you got a kid from the outside who doesn't know the the pizzeria's culture Mm -hmm. and he's telling guys that have been with me for seven years 10 years even two years you know what to do and it fucks up the culture Mm -hmm. in the pizzeria so now what we do is we hire like young kids that like as dishwashers or prep cooks Mm -hmm. and then we slowly start to teach them like we'll teach them Garmage station or like the salad station, you know. Then when they get good at that, well, first they'll do prep, you know. Then they'll go to the salad station. Mm-hmm. Then we'll teach them dough. After they start to learn the dough, we'll bring them to the pizza oven. And they can work the oven a little bit, mm-hmm. and then we start like on weekdays during the day. They'll start making pizzas, and before you know it, like we just did it with this this kid Mario that I have. I never heard of pizzerias having stations. Mm. I usually you hear that with with restaurants, right. like you know, antipasto dessert right. station. Pasta entree station. So walk us through that a little bit about the stations in your pizzeria. So the biggest thing for me, you know, I obviously growing up Italian, I grew up in an Italian family. My parents are from Sicily. <clears throat> they were both born there? My father was born there and my mother's two oldest sisters were born there. And my mother was born here. So they both grew up in Italian speaking households. Like my father was born there, but my mother actually speaks better Italian than my father does mm-hmm. dialect, you know, whatever. But your, your parents met here? They met here, yeah. They met in Bay Ridge. They met at like a bar in Bay Ridge, like one of the bar, one of the bars in Saturday Night Fever. You know, They're like <laughs> we met in the bar at the bar in Saturday Night Fever. That's a nice love story. Yeah, exactly. I kind of when, I, when I'm sitting yeah. with somebody, and especially you know, we hung out a couple of times. I'd like to hear how your parents met and how you got your name. I love you know? that too. Yeah. I, I was just listening when you guys were talking to the guy Rocco, and you were saying like, yeah, you don't meet that many other people named Rocco mm-hmm. unless they're Italian. And it's so funny because I just had that conversation with one of my friends. Like, I grew up with so many Roccos, Santos, like, like, like Italian names that you don't really hear. Vito. You know, how many yeah. kids that you know named Vito now? Yeah. You know, but I grew up with a ton of kids like that. And, um, yeah, they're just like old names. I prefer the old school names, though. Yeah, me too. Like, keeping it traditional. I love when you name, like, when people name their kids after somebody in their family. You know, it's like, it's honoring somebody in your family. It's like... I heard, I heard you talking about this on the last podcast and people will go and name their kid after a celebrity. It's like, to me, it doesn't mean, that's like... Or a flower they like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who were you named after? I was named after my grandfather. I, like, I was named after, literally named after my grandfather. On your sense. dad's side? On my father's side, yep. So you're the, eldest, you're the eldest boy? I'm the eldest boy. Do you have brothers and sisters? I do. I have a younger brother, two years younger than me. I have a younger sister. Well, we grew, like, grew up very close. And um, my grandfather is Francesco Pinello, but no middle name. And that, so I was named after my grandfather, Francesco Pinello. When I was a kid, they used to always make me say, you know, Francesco Pinello, como mio nonno, you know, like uh, I'm named after my grandfather. Yeah. I repeat that a million times. And I, even as an adult, <laughs> Frankie, when you were little, you were so cute. You used to say, <laughs> Francesco Pinello, como mio nonno, you know. So I joke around now when people are like, what's your name? I'm like, Francesco Pinello, como mio nonno. <laughs> <laughs> when did you think you started going by Frank more? When, like, when I started going to school, everybody just called me Frankie as a kid, and then they started calling me Frank, and, um, you know, you were talking about the stations. I went to the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park, which is like a classical French, you know, it's classical French cuisine. When you go there, mm-hmm. you learn, like, the French brigade system, how to break down the restaurant and stations, all that, which we'll get into, but everybody started calling me Francesco again when I went back there, because a lot of European chefs, a lot of people... Just, you know, taking attendance in the class, Francesco Pinello, oh, Francesco. So then all of a sudden after, you Call know, me Frank. 15 years, I know I liked it. I really yeah. liked it because, you know, my grandmother calls me Francesco. A lot of, any Italians that I know call me Francesco. So all of my college friends know me as Francesco, a lot of them. I like that. I get, that shows a lot when you, 
Francesco, that's that's yeah, class. Yeah. There's a lot of Franks. Everybody's a Frank. Well, the other thing, though, was, like, when I opened up the pizzeria, I didn't want to be, like, the Italian kid with, like, the super Italian name, you know? <laughs> it's like, you open up a pizzeria in Brooklyn, I'm Francesco from the pizzeria, you know? <laughs> yeah. They're like, so, you know, we had, like, a really dope New York Times article when we first opened, and um, she's like, so, what's your name? I'm like, my name is Francesco Pinello, but, you know, everybody calls me Frank. And she was like, all right, it's like, I wanted to keep it. I don't want it to be corny, you know? And then uh, she's like, so should I put you down as like the pizzaiolo for just, I'm like, you could just call me the pizza man, you know? Mm-hmm. The owner yeah. of the pizza man is like, sometimes I feel like it gets overdone, you know, yeah, in the culture. Yeah. Yeah, people but do it a little too hard. Like we're saying, you have stations in your pizzeria. So it's not no yeah. ordinary pizzeria. Yeah. When you when you walk in there, the vibes are like, it's a slice shop. Like You feel it's real New York. Yes. But then I feel the product is way above a lot of people. I think, like, so, like, I, w- I became, like, a student of the game when we talk about, like, food and food culture. Um, I became really obsessed with chefs where they worked, the chefs back in France, you know. Um, you know, whether, you know, you, you're talking about, um, like, guys like Paul Bocuse or um, Escoffier, like, guys that really, like, started Trois Brothers. Mm-hmm. I really got into that, and then, you know, being from New York – some of the best restaurants in the country are here. So learning where everybody came from, you know, Danielle Belude was from Lyon in France. He worked for Paul Bocuse and there's like these trees, you know, that you could follow back. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got really fascinated with that. And from there, I, I really took in like the whole idea of the French brigade system that in a restaurant, it's very important to have, you know, a chef. So a I'm, a, chef. I'm not going to lie. I'm clueless when you say French brigade system. You're saying <laughs> like... Stations and just well, explain more, that. more so like I worked in a lot of pizzerias and you would go in and there was the owner, there was the manager, right? And then there was the pizza guy. And that, and then everybody else just kind of fell into line. Like a dishwasher if you really were had the yeah. luxury of it. Yeah, you know? exactly. If you had the luxury of having a dishwasher. Delivery guys. Right, delivery guys. But when you walk into a, if you work in a, a proper French restaurant, um, it's very, it's very specific and every French restaurant is the same. There's usually like a head chef and then there's a chef sous de chef. cuisine. Yeah. Sous chef. The sous chef usually is, is head chef and sous chef is most restaurants. But mm-hmm. if you're talking like, you know, like um, like Restaurant Daniela per se, it's like the, the head chef. And there's a chef de cuisine. Then there's the sous chef. Then there's mm-hmm. all the different stations. Saucier, right? The guy that just makes the sauces. Mm-hmm. Roast station, fish station, garmage, which is all like the cold mm-hmm. stuff like salads. And work your way. Turn up, there's... Like, even positions that are just for, like, the guys that are, like, the porters, you know, that help out and work all the different stations. So, those titles, I try to, like, take that idea of the French Brigade system because it works it so your, well. put it to your business. Exactly. That's cool, yeah. Exactly. I never thought of it like that, but you're, you're 100% right. That, that would make it more fluid. It makes it more fluid, and it gives people, like, a sense of um, accomplishment when they start working through the stations and moving up because you see the kid that goes from being a a dishwasher or a prep cook, and then he moves up to salad station. Then he moves up to pizza. And you get a raise every time you move up, you know? Mm-hmm. You move up to the ovens. And when you're on the ovens, like, oh, shit, he's doing the ovens. So like, so being the pizza man is your, your sous chef that's or like your the, head chef. That's like the big dick energy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> is, is the pizza man. Is so, the, all right, let's, let's walk through how many stations you have and how you made that conversion. Right. So, you know, we have a pretty small place, but it was still important to carve out like very, very specific station. So if you, if we go from the back, we have the front of the pizzeria. Not that many people know this, but if you go into the back, we have a prep area as well. That's mm-hmm. kind of, you know, in the back building. And um, so in the back, we have a dough station. Very specific is, you know, the the, uh, the Hobart mixer is there. And then we have like a, a butcher's block wood table. And then all of, I use another French word is mise en place is basically like, all it literally means have your shit in place. So all your mise en place, all of your prep stuff is set up there, very neat and clean for the for the dough guy. So, in other words, all the tins for the dough for the pizza dough is there. All of our bus tubs with um with our flour mix is in there. That's all ready to go. All of the uh, the yeast is in the walk in. It's already weighed out, ready for everything. The scales. So when we're teaching somebody about the dough station. They don't have to run around the kitchen to find things. Everything for the dough station is right, right there. there. Yep. And then, 
you move over to the table next to the dough station, and that's that's a prep table. It's just a stainless steel table, but I make sure the guys know this is the prep station, you know? So that's where the guys will cut onions, they'll slice the um, uh, pepperoni, you know, the... We make fresh mozzarella cheese for all of the pizzas, so we'll pull all the curd there. And <clears throat> I want to take one step back real quick on the dough. When you say the tins, right, you're saying every pizza you put on a separate tin, or do you, like, get one of the big trays and then put, like, nine in one? I'm just curious. Yeah, no, that's a good question, actually. It's a really good question. So those proofing tins, especially if you go to Italy, you go to Europe, everybody uses the white proofing boxes. Mm -hmm. And, they, you know, for certain pizzerias, it's great. But in New York, I'm sure you guys know, if you go into a pizzeria, you'll see, like, the, the stainless steel tins. Yeah, and they stacked stack. up on each other. Exactly. For me, those tins, they're easy to stack. And if you're in Brooklyn and Manhattan and you have, like, a little fucking kitchen, mm -hmm. it's easier to kind of move those lines and tins around. around you grab, go grab ten boxes. of them. Exactly. Now, do you have to refrigerate your dough after you make it, or...? Yeah, so the way that we make our dough, it's kind of like a mix between Italian dough and, and you know, the classic New York-style American pizza or whatever. So um, we, uh, yeah, we, we, we do, we proof it out first. Mm -hmm. We batch proof it in, like, you know, uh, the regular atmosphere, weather, whatever you want to call it. If it's, if it's really hot outside, we won't keep it out for too long. We'll work with a little bit colder water. And... Um, if it's cold outside, you know, use lukewarm water. We'll let it proof outside. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of boil it up and put it in the fridge and let it sit in the fridge. And that time in the fridge, it's a slower proofing process, but I think it does a lot for the pizza. Yeah, so you'd said the dough, and then the next was the stainless steel station? Oh, so yeah, so uh, that was the prep station next to that. And those are like, you know, some... The, the dough guy's experienced guy, but the prep guy is usually a younger kid learning from, from, the, uh, from the guy who makes the dough. Then as you come to the front... You have dishwashing and dishwashing station and everything there for the guys to keep the dishes clean. You know, the racks for drying everything. And then we have a, like a, a salad prep station for any salads that have to go out. We have the pizza station, the oven station, and then we have saute. So it's, it's like, you know, I don't even know how many square feet. It's very small. But um, probably like as big as this right here. This yeah, like? yeah, like uh, like basically it's the like pizza a ring man, around like that, right? Yeah, it's like a little little rectangle almost, and like the pizza man just has to take one step to get to the oven, and the saute station is literally they're bumping elbows, but to to carve it out, mm -hmm. it's important to have like, in my opinion, to have like those defined stations. So Assembly line, exactly, kind of, right? exactly. If uh, if a chicken parm goes in, you know, that's printing on the saute station. And that guy's taking the ticket, mm -hmm. and he knows to make a chicken parm. How, how extensive is your menu? You make the chicken parms and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. So the chicken parm, we get the, the chicken bone in. We bone out the chicken. Then we brine it. Bone in? It. Yeah. So Damn. we use the thighs. We use the yeah, chicken yeah. thighs. Oh, okay. juicier? You like? Yes, yeah. yes. Chicken thighs do taste better than the breast. I, I, I love chicken breast, and I... but. Chicken thighs, to me, if you brine them and you get them just to, like, really get some nice flavor so they're not slimy or anything, mm -hmm. they have, it's, like, the really delicious. I, people that love food will always tell you the thighs are better yeah. than the breast. But, um, if someone never, okay, if you haven't been to Best Pizza, there's, I don't know even know how many locations. I know they're everywhere. Yeah, we got a bunch. We got a bunch. Where, where are they? Maybe we could list them, so. So, uh, the original in Williamsburg, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, we're there 14 years now. October, what city is date? Getting close to it. Honestly, the 16th. Tomorrow is for what's today? The 15th. Today's the 15th. I think. Tomorrow is the 16th. Oh. Today's the 16th. Today's the 16th. Oh, so today's the anniversary. Anniversary is today. 14 we gotta go years. eat best pizza after this. Get the wow. fuck out of here. Today's I love the 16th. That. That's crazy. awesome, bro. Congratulations, bro. Thank you. It's Thank amazing. you. Yeah. 14 years. So, so 14 Williamsburg. Years. Williamsburg was the original. Yep. Before we even say the other, why Williamsburg first? Being a kid from Bensonhurst, why'd you pick here? Because the real Italians are here, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's it this is where Napoli Danza. Well, this is <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, I didn't even pick it. I was working for Roberta's at the time. That's and right. That's the right. Guys from Roberta's were like, you know, we know like you're a Brooklyn kid that you're obsessed with the slice concept. I, I used to talk about it all the time. I'm going to open up my own slice, please. And at that time, honestly, Really, there was only artichoke pizza that, like, where there were young kids doing the slices. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it was like, you know, Da Vinci's, L&B, um, 
in my neighborhood, J, uh, J&V on 64th Street, Lanny's Pizzeria. It's old timers. They've had pizzerias forever. Long Island, you know, places like Umberto's. Um, so I had this, like, obsession with a lot of people were doing the Roberta-style pizzerias, like the Napoli-style pizza, mm-hmm. making it cool in sort of an industrial setting. And um, I was like, I want to open up a slice shop. Like, not reinvent the wheel, but just do it with, like, the best ingredients I could find. Um, kind of ha- kind of make it understated, like you were saying. Like, mm-hmm. feels like a regular slice shop. We don't call it margarita, cheese pizza, or white, or square, round, you know. But I guess kind of, um, like... Uh, Un- undersell it, but over deliver is was kind of like the mentality. Yeah, that I like that. I got a question for you both. So, as business owners, right? The dream is you learn from somebody, and then hopefully you have your own business, right? Mm-hmm. How do you guys feel? You know, you have a loyal worker for years, and I'm talking, let's say, 14 years. Let's say you had somebody 14 years. He's like, listen, boss, appreciate everything you taught me. I'm gonna go out and venture and start my own pizzeria. What's your initial reaction to that? So. It's funny that you say that. I have a very, like, so it's happened to me a bunch of times. Um, in the case that we were just talking about, I don't know if the cameras were on or not, but I had a pizza man come to me, a really good pizza man, worked for me for two or three years, and um, Italian kid, and he's like, I'm ready to go on my own. And I was like, great, God bless. But then he goes, would you want to come in with me on it? So in cer- certain situations where I have the opportunity to go into business with a great employee, I jump on that 90% of the time. Okay. It's, it's preferred. It's preferred because I get to continue that relationship and continue the culture that we've built together. Two years of working is a long time, you know? Now we get to take that into a new spot. I knew what he was capable of. Mm-hmm. And we have a successful restaurant in New Rochelle. It's called Pizzeria La Rosa. New Rochelle. Yeah, Rochelle. yeah, New Rochelle. <laughs> yeah, they say it's weird It's called Pizza there. La Rosa? Yeah, Pizzeria La Rosa. Yeah, okay. Pizzeria La Rosa. So it's like Sit the same down. concept? We serve very similar pizzas at best, but it's... it's um. You know, you could sit down, you get a glass of wine. We have a full wine li- list, cocktail list. I'm sorry, yeah. you didn't push to do best pizza there? Like, when he when he brought the idea to you? At the time, I, like, you know, we, we were talking about doing the best pizza. I was, like, very protective over the brand. And I didn't have any other pizzerias at that point. So, in my head, I wasn't going to open any more best pizzas. I just wanted to have one. And... You know, you guys know, being around, like, Italians and being around people who own restaurants, it's always about, oh, how many locations you got? <laughs> and it's like, locations don't always equal money or yeah. success. You know, you could have one place that crushes, then you could have four other places that are sucking money out of that place yeah. or sucking talent out of it, you know? Yeah, you got to yeah. move your good guys there, yeah, then yeah. the good place starts yeah. starts being shitty. So I, I very quickly started to realize that. I'm like, you know... It's not about having a lot of places, it's about having one. So at the time, I didn't want to have any other best pizzas. And I had this idea that La Rosa was going to be like like a like a 50s-style pizzeria, almost like the pizzerias in New Poles. I mean, um, sorry, New Haven, mm. right? Uh, in New Haven. Like neon, the neon signs. Yeah, uh, very named after, yeah. like, they don't have fancy names. They're named after people's, la- like, last name, like Sally's, you know, yeah. Frank Peppy's, you know? Yeah. So we called the pizzeria La Rosa because Matt, who I opened it with, his mother's maiden name was La Rosa. So I said, you got any good family names that sound good in a restaurant? I'm like, Pinello doesn't, re- I don't know. He's like, well, my my grandmother was Vida La, La Rosa. Vida La Rosa. Fine. Mike, what's a better name than that? You know? <laughs> so the corporation's Vida, Vida La, Rosa. La Rosa, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How did you get the name Best Pizza? Because that's actually a cheat code. It's funny, I was just right? thinking about it as you're Probably talking. Probably the best pizzeria name ever. Yeah. It's like. Because think about it. If I'm sitting here right now and I'm from, uh. Arkansas, yeah. and I'm in New York, best pizza in Williamsburg, you're going to come up. Yeah. yeah. Well, to be honest with you, another thing I didn't pick. Um, I was partners with the guys from Roberta's at the time, and you know they had the, the location that came up. Um, it was formerly Brooklyn Star before I was there for a year. They had a big fire. The owner of Brooklyn Star was this guy named Kino Baka. He was the original chef of Momofuku. He answered a monster.com ad, and it was Dave Chang. So those Man. two over yeah. Momofuku. That's and crazy. So Kino and Roberta is the guys from Roberta's were my partners, and they were both idols to me because in the industry at the time, they had achieved already massive success. You know, Momofuku was just worldwide name already, and Roberta's was on its way. You know, it was very popular in Brooklyn and New York, and it started getting international, like national and international fame just because 
the quality of the food and the way that those got their swag, you know, kind of very hipster swag, which I knew nothing about. Like when I came back to Brooklyn, um, I was surprised how much it changed and what it was like here because I was living in Bensonhurst at the time and came to Williamsburg. What the fuck is this, you know? <laughs> 16 years ago, so we're talking about 2007? Yep, 2000. We opened in 2010, so I was working with them 2007, 2008. 2009, we started working on the pizzeria and we opened in 2010. So um, the neighborhood was very different. There was still a lot of Italians in the neighborhood. Um, and yeah, they found a sign. Anthony Falco, who's also working for the Birdie. He lives right here, by the way. Yes, yeah. yes. He's an old friend. We had him on the pod years ago. Like he was a he was on the show before we really stepped up our game. And it's funny, I was gonna say it like both of you guys came from that uh Roberta's farm system. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. A lot of great lot yeah, of good great prospects groups. over there. Yeah. A lot, he man. makes a sick dog. Is there any is there any yes. other one that came out of there? Oh that we don't know? There's so many people that came out of they came out of Roberta's that, you know, eventually opened places up. Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm blanking right now. But there's, there's um, a lot of kids left, like, came to Roberta's and worked there and then went to other places around the country. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a kid, Tom, that went to Pittsburgh. He's got, like, one of the most popular restaurants in Pittsburgh right now. Um, kids like Anthony Falco that do a lot of pizza stuff. I, I, I feel like I'm blanking, but as we talk, I'm sure yeah. I'll come up with some Roberta's, more. have you ever ate there, Rock? Or Roberta's? No. Yeah. no. So Roberta's, I think I ate there once or twice, and it's very hipster. Very. Their merch is the most hipster, but <laughs> super cool. Yeah. But then when you eat the pizza, they have like Gaja Cavallo pizza. I'm like, what the? So like, it's it's crazy. Like you know how you said overselling? Yeah. Like the pizza almost, it doesn't match with what you're seeing in there. Well, the funny thing, so one of the first times I went there once, you know, because I heard about it, I took the train out there. I'm like, where the fuck? Am I, you know, in the middle of Bushwick, which, you know, Bushwick and those neighborhoods were always like bad neighborhoods growing up. So I never went to Bushwick. I never hung out in Bushwick before. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I spend a lot of time in Bushwick and especially around that time. But when I went there for the first time, I was in there and I was like, this place is crazy. Like, it's very hipster. It's got the culture I don't really know about. But the food is very familiar. So I was trying to explain to my father at the time, like what I wanted to do, like restaurants are changing. You don't have to work in a fine dining restaurant to cook really good food anymore. You know, like Dave was serving, um, you know, uh, like heritage pork, like um, really, really crazy uh, um, heritage pork uh, at Momofuku at the time, Mm. you know, and using like the best noodles that you could get from Japan and making these stocks, stuff that you would only see in fine dining restaurants. But you walked into this noodle shop and you got the same, you know, service experience and you got the same food experience except in it's a more, small it's more city. casual too. yeah much more casual you didn't have to dress up you know there wasn't maitre d's none of that it was just getting right to the customer and i i, I really like loved that idea that like as a pizzeria i could do the same thing and still keep the prices low but do like use really special flour you know proof the dough in a very special way use ingredients that other places weren't using and, um, you know, that, that whole idea really kind of stuck out to me. Yeah. So, yeah, the, anyway, the guys from Roberta's happened when we were building it out and painting the place. They found a sign that said Best Pizza. Wow. And, they, just, uh, they just found that sign? In Bushwick, there was, like, a pizzeria that <laughs> was, like... crazy. It was, like, hanging off the side of a pizzeria or something. And we were thinking about what we were going to name it. And they were tossing around names, like 33, because the address is 33. 33, have a mile. Pizzeria 33, something like that. Or they were talking about, you know, we were trying to think of names. And then I walked in one day, and he's like, we got the name. I'm like, what? And he showed me the sign. He's like, best pizza. I'm like, best pizza? You, you didn't like it at first? I was fucking terrified. I'm like, you're going to make me open a pizzeria in Brooklyn called best pizza? Mm-hmm. He's like, he pats me on the back. He's like, I know you're up for it. And Chris Parrichini, who's the owner, he's, a, he's, an, Italian, he's an Italian kid. And uh, man, whatever. And um, he was like one of the most interesting people I've ever met. He had, really had his finger on the pulse. Bro, I, have, I have so many questions I want to ask you. I don't know which which one to ask first, but we're talking about best pizza. Your pizza is very unique because you got the sesame seeds in the crust. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, maybe it's not just in the crust. You could probably tell us better, but it's all over the dough, right? No, it's actually only... So we make one pie, which is like the white pie. You know, growing up, every time you went to a pizzeria, there was... The rigotta pizza, yeah. you know? And um, 
So growing up, actually the first time that I cooked for those guys, they asked me to come to the location and cook. So I was like, I'm not just going to come and let them bring me the dough and all that stuff. I'm like, I got to bring some of my own ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I went to Coluccio. You know Coluccio? Yeah. Sounds Center? so yeah. familiar. Yeah. 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 Coluccio's, you know yeah. it is. They're Calabrian. They're like on, uh, they're like on, off 65th, like yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right off of the BQE. Um, and it's uh, it's a big Calabrian like uh, grocery store. Like Italian no, no. grocery store. Oh, oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, okay. always goes there. Yeah, okay, Mine okay, too. Okay, okay. Yeah. My no, no, no. And we're not even from there. We're from here. And we're like, we got to go to Coluccio's today. They're so the best. Like they travel to 40 Amazing minutes. Amazing for... family. Exactly. Yeah. Travel to 40 minutes. But you go in and they got... The fucking bacala hanging, yeah. all spread out. You know, they have all like the mixed nuts. You yeah. know, you say, after yeah, yeah. dinner you have fruit and nuts. Yeah. Yeah. All all that old school shit, like the anoletti pasta stuff you can't find in regular mm -hmm. regular, uh, you know, grocery stores. So um, I went to Coluccio and I got like tomato paste. I got sesame seeds because sesame seeds, especially in Sicily, it's in a lot of Sicilian baking. And to me, like that nutty flavor when you have a brioche with sesame seeds on it. I love it. Even like a hero with seeds on it. I really like, the, you know, Italian bread with seeds. It's just a, pref a preference of mine. Like the semolina bread you prefer with the, se the yeah, sesame I seeds? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, it's got to have yeah. seeds. I love the seeds, you know. Some people don't like it, but me personally, I think it adds a nice flavor. So um, as a kid, I remember going to a pizzeria in, in the neighborhood, and they had like a, like, a, like a regular margarita cheese pie, but it was a little different. They had the cheese on the bottom, they had the sauce on top, and they had sesame seeds around. And I remember as a kid eating it and just thinking it was so different and, like, why didn't more places do that? And this one place just stuck in my head all these years. So when it was time to cook for them, I brought the sesame seeds, I brought tomato paste, I brought anchovies, like, all this shit that people... Sicilian. Like, yeah, Sicilian. <laughs> really? The oregano on the stem. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like, the really yeah, yeah, good yeah. oregano on the stem. And they're like, you're ready to cook? I'm like, yeah, hold on. I start fucking pulling out like the sick ricotta, the ricotta salada, yeah, yeah, yeah. fucking <sighs> tomato paste, sesame seeds. And they're looking at me like, you came for battle, kid. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, bro, this is my audition. I'm yeah. cooking for my idols. Like, I'm not, I'm not sleeping on this. Like, I was prepared. And um, so the sesame seeds I cooked on the pie that day, and it was a hit from then on. And it ended up on our white pie. Yeah, because that the white, it had like caramelized yeah. onions too? Or am I not So, yup, yup. So... Also, another thing, I, I worked for a really great chef. His name was Nate Appleman, uh, Keith McNally restaurant. He's in the news now a lot. He's, he's kind of a crazy guy, but a great restaurateur. And um, they had uh, caramelized onions as a topping for pizza. And I was like, you know, I remember in, in Sicily, like when you have this sfingione, there's always those onions on top yeah, with the breadcrumbs, breadcrumb. you know. It adds like this really deep flavor. And I was like, that's an interesting topping, you know? And I always, I was another one that, like, working in restaurants and going to school, you kind of pick up these little things here and there. And that was another one I took with me. So when we were making the white pie, my whole plan was to put arugula on it, right? So I was going to do, every time we heated up the white slice, I was going to mix up a little ricotta with olive oil, I mean, mix up a little arugula with a little olive oil, salt and pepper, and put it on top of the pie as soon as it came out of the slice, as soon as it came out of the oven. So I was doing that, and I was having the guys test it, and the same guy, Chris, he was like, it's good, but I feel like the flavors are collide. And so he was, like, really pushing me, like, you know, let's put more effort into it, put more effort into it. So I was reworking the white pie. I put the sesame seeds around, took away the arugula, and I was like, you know, it's a white pie. The ricotta should be the star of the show, right? So we got the Calabro ricotta, like the old school, another one from, like, Rhode Island and New Haven in the old tin with, like, you know, the holes in the side so the water yeah, can leak yeah, out. Come out. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and uh, so we, I used that regatta, let the regatta be the star of the show, put a little bit of the caramelized onions to kind of bring some sweetness. We put lemon in the regatta and uh, the sesame seeds. And I gave it to him. It was, like, the fifth or sixth time I made the pie. And he was like, bingo. He's like, this is it. And that's probably, like, our, our best-selling pizza to this day. That's one of my favorite things to do is uh, – create like new menu I just be like fat yeah. smoke Fuck and yeah. just get in the kitchen and yeah. like you said it took you five six times to get there mm -hmm. and I don't think honestly without without someone there like pushing me and telling me like the first one wasn't good you, you would have settled I would have settled constructive criticism you need absolutely, that bro absolutely absolutely and I especially like you mentioned and it's ideal in like the small business world to like work for somebody and learn from them mm -hmm. having a mentor to me is like 
you know, I have a lot of mentors, people that I've worked with that, uh, that I worked for and like, I hold them to the highest regard. You know, it's like the things that you guys have taught me. You know, it's like, oh, that's the only reason I'm I, I want to take a step back and hear how you went from being young Francesco Pinello in that class to going into culinary school. I don't know. Was it always an idea for you that you said, like, I want to open a pizzeria? Or did you want to be a chef? Or how did that all, like, come about? So, to be honest with you, you're, you're like this. Um, I... You know how coming from Italian families, you know, the commitment to food, especially if your family's like from the old country, it's it's psychotic. You know what I mean? You wake up in the morning and, you know, your grandmother, your mother's talking about what you're having for lunch and having yeah, for yeah. dinner. You know, <laughs> my grandfather was out, you know, on the side of the highway in New Jersey because they found like the verdura, like the, like, uh, for Guguza <laughs> growing yeah. wild. Finocchio the on the Finocchio. side of the road. Literally, literally. The other ones that pulled over with the garbage bags. Literally, yeah, yeah, you know. No, yeah. honestly, you know. Italians do that shit with mushrooms, like yeah. crazy. Mushrooms, Salad, too. The fungi, forget it. Yeah. End of the woods. In the woods, they go out there foraging. My nun was on the side of a uh, fucking, like, I-95, <laughs> cutting, <laughs> cutting the verdura. Right, I thought no, we were no, the only ones. No, 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 I'll be the verdura. Like, out in the fucking country, like, out in the side of... That thing could kill you. You don't even know if it's poison. Is that legal you. to do that? Is it who is that owned by that uh, land? Is that public? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's New Jersey. It's they, go they, they gotta start ta- Yeah, they gotta start taxing the <laughs> Italians for grabbing all those dandelion greens. Oh, that's but funny, um, bro. but yeah, so literally, you know, they would be out grabbing the verdura or going buying bread, whatever, and he would bring it home, and my grandmother would be sitting at the kitchen table, you know. Cleaning, cleaning it, up, yeah. you know. You never knew what was gonna be on the table when you walked downstairs yeah, yeah. in the basement, you know. Fucking cow tongues and crazy the lamb heads. The, what do they call those? The um, capotes. Uh, no? uh, yeah, ca- uh, capotel, capadel, capadel, something like that. Capazel. Yeah, it's the same capadel. The same with the accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so what did your parents do for a living? My my father is actually like um, he's actually he's like he's an artist. So my father, that's the unique thing about me is that like, um, well, I feel lucky about it, is that like. I had a lot of cousins and family members that, you know, hung out at the club playing cards and, you know, watching the, ta- the soccer games. But my father wasn't like that at all. He wasn't like a neighborhood guy type of guy. He was very much into art, you know. So he had his own dark room and f- for photography. Cool, cool. He painted, like, really crazy abstract stuff when he was young. It was it was out of sync with the neighborhood, but they... He should have been in Williamsburg they at that love, time. Yeah. Well, he, he used to hang out in the village, and when he came to Williamsburg, he, him and my mother would always be like, this reminds me of the village. Like, nobody talks about the village anymore like that, yeah. you know? This reminds me of the village. When we were kids, it was like, yeah. you know, the cool place to be. So he would hunt mushrooms, and, all this, and that's how you got that, that edge? So my grandmother and my grandfather, we had this crazy commitment to food every at the end of the summer you know we would get bushels of tomatoes and we would do tomato sauce every year like on the dot you know mm-hmm. my grandfather would wake us up at seven o'clock in the morning or we'll clean the tomatoes put a cook them put them through the machine you guys know yeah, brutal though can so brutal. Uh, the it's a lot of work it's, brutal, a lot but of it's work. the best it's like hard to explain 100 percent. i couldn't have said it better it's like brutal but the best and i wouldn't trade those days for anything um and you know and I, my first job was at a restaurant. And growing up, everybody would always say, oh, we need to sell nona sauce. We need to open a restaurant. But they would say it not knowing anything about the restaurant industry. Like my grandfather was a janitor in Manhattan Plaza. He was in the union, you know. Mm-hmm. My father followed like an art career around and ended up working in graphic arts in Manhattan. So he, w- he would do like, um, you know, big posters for American Express and stuff like that and, you know, send them out in the messengers back in the day before there was the internet. Mm -hmm. So he, nobody was in the food industry, but I kind of got obsessed with the idea of like, I come from this family that makes all this amazing food. Like my grandmother's repertoire was a different dish every night. Like she didn't have, it was just off the top of the head. Like, you know, whatever she had, whatever she had. And it was always seasonal and local, but I didn't realize that until I got older and understood like, the significance of that. And there was fig trees in the back. They would pick fucking a million figs and cook with that. There was, my grandfather literally grew grapes in the backyard in Brooklyn, you know. Um, we got Guta, of course. Did he make wine? He made wine. Yeah. So in one room, he did wine. And then we had the sausita set, like the dry and the sausage. Cantina, like a cantina, pretty much? Exactly. Ex- 
Exactly. So in that same room where he had the wine being made, um, we would also hang the sausages in there, mm -hmm. right? And as a kid, he's like, you know, out of the freezer, he was taking the intestines out, you know? <laughs> and then we had the little hand crank yeah. where you yeah, put yeah, the yeah, intestines yeah, yeah. on the hand crank and put the sausages right. through. Yeah. And Francesco, be good. And I would have to hold it, and he would come with a lasso and rope it yeah. up. He knew how to tie like, it. Did it ever break when you hold it? Yeah. He, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. If it broke, he would lose his mind. Manaja yeah, miseria. <laughs> so like, I, it, yeah, literally, it was it was that important, like you know. And then, um, so in that room, I learned this later on that like, uh, by making the wine in that room and hanging the sausage and then drying all the big agutas for seeds for next year, mm -hmm. all of those things would aid each other. So like the fermentation from the wine yeah. would help. He never puts pink salt inside of the cured meat, but nobody ever got sick. And you know you're using raw meat and letting it dry. You oh, didn't put no salt in the meat. Not like the, you know the pink salt. It's like the curing salt. You put regular salt, yeah, but yeah, yeah. usually when you cure to be safe, you put this. It's a nitrate, right? Okay. And it's called pink salt. And any chef that makes uh, charcuterie now uses it. That way you don't get like these crazy food right, right, illnesses. Yeah, yeah. So he never knew about it's, that. It's raw meat at the end of the day that we're just drying. Exactly. It's never getting cooked. Mm -hmm. But the old. Just like the years and years of doing it the way his grandfather taught him and their grandfather taught him, I never understood the science of it until I got to school. But in that room, like everything kind of aided each other, and the wine helped the sausage ferment and the dry, like the pasta dry, and everything kind of worked together. It, it became its own ecosystem because of the good bacteria. <laughs> it's yeah, fucking yeah. crazy. What, you know? what did what'd you guys call that room? Uh, the the wine room basically. Yeah, I, I would like the boom boom room for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, right, that's where all the stuff is happening. You know? <laughs> Did you guys grow up with your family uh, made wine? Yeah, but you know, like what you're saying with the salt, we, we skipped we those wine. pink salt. Yeah, we, we didn't make the wine, but we made tomato. Yeah. And my nonna would make sausages, but we they actually never make it to the final drying part because we're just like yeah, you cut them down and throw them on the grill. I was gonna say rock. I cut you. No, I tell you one thing about Italians. Like every single Italian household has that one room. If there's ever an apocalypse, we're good. <laughs> right? I think we are all made for to survive an apocalypse 100%. because we all have the room with a hundred jars of sauce. We got the pasta in the cabinet. There's like 50 boxes of pasta in oh there. Oh, my God. We got the dry sausages that's hanging, you know. The pickles. What about all the yeah, pickles? The all the, pickle, the, pickled the, egg the pickled egg plants. Oh, my God. Bro. The pickled egg plant. We do it at Best Pizza, my grandmother's recipe. Yeah? Where you cut it thin in, yeah. the, in the little slices, oh. marinate it, like salt it. It doesn't even taste like eggplant. It's got a whole different texture once you add the salt You know to what it. our nonna used to make that everybody in our family would go crazy for is the... The cut up red pepper and the mm. olive oil for the oh top of the pasta. That's like the Calabrian bomba, like right, like yeah, the yeah. Uh, like the little, yeah, like the little hot peppers. The one thing with um, the relish, almost right, exactly. Yeah, it's like it looks like a relish is green. This is red, right, so right, but it's the same kind of consistency and every day. What I was gonna say too, like we didn't have a specific room. I think our nonna's basement, when they dry stuff, it gives that weird taste. Yeah, yeah, because it's like on this block. There's like a running gum. There's a, there's a water problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we always have water problems on this too whole block. Too nobody, much moisture. Nobody has finished basements here for that right. reason. Right. But um, what she would do is in the kitchen, she would put like two sticks, like an X, and just hang the sausage, but they never made like it. Like the prune sticks, right? Just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, literally. That's what They were so resourceful that they knew that if there was too much water downstairs, it was too humid, you couldn't yeah. dry the sausage down there. Yeah. And then you had it, you know, they figure out the best place in the house. And just that, that knowledge, I was like always, you know, it always like blew my mind. And my grandfather would make wine and put him in the big Carlo Rossi, you know, yeah, wine. Yeah, oh, the best. And it had be to like, be in that. It had oh, to be in that. It had to be if in If it that. wasn't in that, it wasn't good. Right. And then he would send me, my brother, my sister to get... Usually me and my brother get the wine, but God forbid you shook it too much because all the <laughs> sediment was yeah, there. Yeah. Then fucking sediment was in the wine. They would get all pissed. <laughs> like get cracked for that too, you know? My favorite traditional food that we make is the dried sausage though. It's so good. Yeah. Even even when I was a kid and we went back, because we went back every summer, my mom's, uh, my dad's mother, none on that side, I lived there. She would always save me like 
oh. bunch of dry sausage from the year. Mm. And she would make zonia. You know what zonia is? It's like the pig fat that they put the sausage in. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. They put it in the big jar. It's yeah, like yeah. the oil. And it, they looks, put it, it looks like a science project. Yes. Like, it looks like, like formaldehyde or something, <laughs> right? I know. I was just going to say that. Did you guys used to put it in the oil and then you had to peel the skin yeah, off yeah, afterwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The but then like the, the sausage like that, when you just squeeze it, it's like, there's like all this like, I can't Flavor. explain. It. Yeah, it's, like it's fat and, and it's like super red. You know. Yes, yes. And but, they um, put the black peppercorns in there sometimes, so it's got that. You know, every like Napoli, Sicily, even like the towns. My, my mother's from Palermo. My father's from a small town called Balshina. But even the town next to it, Villa Bate, it was like the yeah the bakery. Villa. There's Villa Frate, Villa Bate, Shamina. But they would have different. They would make the, the sausage over here one way. But like a mile down the block, they would make it just a little bit different. So it's like in <laughs> Napoli, is, yeah. you know how it is. That's how right? it is, though. Yeah, it's a little. It's very um regional, but super regional, I should say. So yeah, you know, just growing up like that, I was obsessed with food, um, and I started working in a pizzeria, and then we moved to Long Island, and I worked at a place called Chow Baby. Chow Baby, you said? Yeah, it's a it's a very well known yeah. restaurant in Long Island. There's one in Massapequa, and there's one in in Comac, and they used to, it was like, had a very much of like a gangster kind of feel into it, it was really dope in there, like, really, really well done, and every single night of the week, they had like a lounge singer, like singing like Sinatra, you know, like live, Yeah. and he would walk around and sing and like make jokes, but it got to be like, the neighborhood hangout for all like Italians from Brooklyn. All the how you doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for all the one, for all like you know, <laughs> yeah, all the guys out. The just, Long Island Italians hit different. Uh, we just went to a party. They all walking around. How you doing? Oh, you know? yeah, they, they <laughs> laid on. Thick, I called man. them. How you doing? They're, they're, all, from, they're like all from Brooklyn too. That's oh, my favorite. It's crazy. I was gonna say too. Uh, he just said yeah. from Brooklyn. Like when your parents moved to Long Island, did they feel like we made it? Like we moved to Long Island. <laughs> We're very excited to announce a long-term partnership with the Soto Gastronomia out from Australia. This guy's got a really, really interesting restaurant. The Soto has a very interesting story. So they're first generation Italian Australians. They're basically us in Australia. The Zoto was created in their parents' and grandparents' honor so that they can pay their legacy forward. 100% of their proceeds goes to people in need, charities, and the arts. The Soto will be supporting us this year, so you know the content's going to be even better. Bro, and who knows? Maybe at some point we're going to have to take a trip down on that. Huh? I was always curious how the Italian Australians made food. It's time we find out. Calandra's Bakery, family owned since 1962. Luciana Calandra, Sicilian immigrant, started the bakery in 1962 in Newark, New Jersey, passing it on to his grandkids. The third generation, bacon bread the old school way. Located in your nearest supermarket in New Jersey and New York. And don't forget to visit any of their three locations in New Jersey. Yeah, but it was, I, they did. And it was funny, like what you just said, because when I, my group of friends in Long Island, like four of them had their grandmothers that lived in Bensonhurst. Yeah, around yeah, the yeah. So yeah. we would go back on the weekends. I'd be like, Mom, I'm going to John's grandmother's house, who was like right around the block on 69th uh, awesome. Street. So we all came from the same place. My father went to New Utrecht High School. My best friend's father went to New Utrecht. They went to Shallow together. So it was like, you know, we were out in Long Island. It was like you made it if you went to Long Island or New Jersey, you know. And um, But it wasn't the same. Like, when you're on the block with your family and it's every single vibe, day man. in the same building, with, it's a different world. The neighborhood stoop field. How, the how, neighborhood old, how old were you in that, um, when you were in there at Chow Baby? So I was like, so... Chow baby. Uh, chow baby. So <laughs> chow baby. That's Mickey Smix's glasses. Bro. Yeah, exactly. You know I, I know Smix I heard of him. Nick Smirillo. He's uh he's from Chicago. Comedian. He just oh, moved here. Yeah. He moved here. Yeah, yeah. The name sounds really familiar. Yeah. He lives on. He lives nearby. He has a glasses brand, and it's called Chow baby. He does a lot. Really? He does yeah. a lot of impressions. He I does. gotta check that. Out. Yeah, I gotta I'll check send, that. I'll send it to you. I'm less. I could be lost sometimes when it comes to like pop culture because. I'm in the pizzeria all the time. I barely get a chance. You're to in go tune on. though, bro. I could tell. You having a conversation with Bino before. Yeah. You're pretty in tune with the culture. And He's a hip hop guy, though. Yeah, he yeah, yeah I am. Yeah. I'm a huge hip hop head. I love hip hop. I'm sure we'll get to that. But um, as far as the food thing, when I got a chance to uh, work at Chow Baby, the head chef there had went to the Culinary Institute, and I was like. I, I went to St. Anthony's High School. I played football there. That's so funny you went there. Bro. Yeah, and it was, like, the best. 
But after high school, I didn't get into any colleges. I fucked up. So I used to go to a gym in the neighborhood, and there was these kids at the time. This is I graduated year 2000. So everybody was working in stock, broken, doing stocks, right? And it wasn't like stocks in Manhattan. Like Wolf of Wall Street shit? Literally the boiler rooms. That's what they called them, right? And in in Huntington and in, uh, you know, that area, there was fucking, I don't know how many places where you, I thought they were real stockbrokers when I first met the kids in the gym. Like, you got to come work for us. They all had rollies on. I had sick Benzes, S500 with the navigation. First time I ever saw that. Mercedes. <laughs> I was like, I didn't give a fuck about working as a chef. I wanted to be a stockbroker. You know what I mean? I wanted to go get money. Although, my only job was ever in food, right? So, after high school, I got into no college. I didn't want to go to, like, a community college. So, I was like, Mom, I'm going to be a stockbroker. She's like, oh, stockbrokers make a lot of money. Okay. So, I went. Me and my best friend, we went and worked to these kids in uh, in Huntington, you know, get dressed up every morning, put a suit and tie on, right? Fucking drive to Huntington in my shitty little six Mazda 626, right? With, you know, the fanciest thing, clothes I had on, walk up to this non-discreet office <laughs> and literally just stand in front of a phone and make like a thousand phone cold calls, calls a day. Cold calling. Sounds like fun, man. It was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was, and and you guys, had to dress up for that? Dress up, suit and tie. Everybody was in a suit and tie. And the kids were young, but they all got had a lot of money. And they would abuse the shit out of you. Kids would cry. They would make you pitch, like, in the morning, like, what's the stock of the day? What do you, like, you know, Frank, go. I think, hey, this is, you would make up names. You know what I mean? Hey, this is John Turner from Global Capital. How you doing today, sir? We have a wonderful IPO. <laughs> we're allocated. Yeah. We'll be allocated. You know, that we just got from... Uh, from from uh, Goldman Sachs, you know, we're gonna allocate you ten thousand shares if you get in on the. It's all bullshit. It makes me cringe. It's literally Wolf of Wall Street bullshit. too. Yeah, we gotta talk about doing this movie. By the way, after oh, this, we're gonna talk. Bro. <laughs> you ever see the movie Boiler Room? It was an old movie. No. The Italian actor is a great movie. Ben Affleck is in it when he was really young. Um, the Italian kid, uh, Gen- what's his name, Gennaro something. If you see him, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it was a great movie. It took place in New York. And it literally described what I'm talking about. It's all these kids had money. And they live out in Long Island, big houses with no furniture. It's <laughs> like the, the whole culture. They, everybody was gambling on, yeah. you know, on uh, on horse games. Everybody was into hip hop. We were listening to Nas and Biggie in the office, right? <laughs> and it was just like this fucking real like culture. It was dope. And they sent me to the Series Seven class, and the fucking feds busted in, oh. and they fucking arrested. Everybody and you, you, you didn't get arrested because you were. In I the was class? in the class, so they would put That's money fire. up for you to be in the class, and I was in the class like two buildings down, and you took the class. It was literally like a six month class because you had to learn so much about all the laws of being a stockbroker to be compliant for SEC, and uh, if you if you failed that class, you were fucked, and you could take it maybe you could take it a couple times, but they wouldn't keep paying for you, you know. So it was really important to pass the class, and we were studying for the class, studying, and they fucking got ran in on it and all got busted. And they were, you know, it was funny because one of the stories, they were like, you know, we, they had went to the Super Bowl the year before. As a 19-year-old kid, I was like, you at the Super Bowl? They're like, yeah, we were sitting next to LL Cool J, Red Man, uh, Met the Man, whatever. They were all sitting there, and they loved us because we were Italian. They thought we were like gangsters, right? <laughs> and uh, and then LL Cool J was saying something to one of these stockbrokers, like, you know, being a jerk off. And the kid's like, take it easy, cannabis. Like, you, that was the highlight of his year that he, like, dissed LL Cool J. Like, oh, like saying something about cannabis. And I'm just like, this is some real old 90s, you know what I'm saying? That's fucking funny, bro. Yeah, but those are my idols. Those kids are my idols. So after, you know? after the class got busted... Did you say, okay, let me let me take my chances in culinary school? Yeah, then I was like, fuck this, I'm going back to restaurants. You know, like, I don't, like, you know, I think the kids got, eventually ended up going, like, federal prison for ripping off an old lady. Uh, Just one time? I so think so? there was, like, I, I don't remember the specifics, but um, I think there was, like, one big trade, and uh, it had to do with, like, taking, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand from, like, an old lady. I was like, that's not for me, man. I want to make an honest Yeah, thing. you got to have some... I don't know the right word here. You gotta be some type of person to you gotta be, be in some that field. sleaze ball. You know what I mean? Yes, it, was it takes a special kind of sleaze. Not ball. the first 
time I've heard a story like this. I'm like, this no. is probably the fifth or sixth time. <laughs> I'm sure like you have yeah, cousins yeah, or friends that have done it, and especially yeah. if I'm 41, if they're around my age and you, you know, grew up around I, you. You ever see the kids on TikTok, they're like, you gonna knock on the th- like it's yeah. like two goombas oh, like, and it's all like that sales mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sell always be selling A B C. It's cold milk in the fridge. Like all these taglines, you know. Cold milk in the fridge. Yeah, yeah. Like, we got this. Th- it's cold milk in the fridge. You know, it's like get a whale. Don't be a piker. Like all yeah, these, yeah, yeah, this yeah, crazy yeah. Get shit. Get a whale. Get a whale. Get a whale. Like I love don't that. write wood. Like write when wood was like if you were writing fake, you know, leads. Like, like the lead was like some bullshit guy and you're like, oh, this guy's got a million dollars, you know, five million dollar house. And yeah, so there was there was a whole culture to it, which was cool. But at the end of the day, it was illegal. I didn't really know that. You know what I mean? Until I realized what was going on. That's so cool. And then when that went down, they all went to the mortgage industry and then the mortgage industry tanked the country. All those, so all those kind of businesses are like Ponzi schemes. hundred percent. Like, 100%. basically, like, they sell, like, for women, it would be, like, selling Monet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Like, like, girls that sell Monet, yeah, and then, like... <laughs> Mary can't make it, up. It was a big, funny, there was a big um, thing when I was, like, I don't know if it was around the same time. It was a little after, but all these kids, like, were hustling electricity. Because you're paying a lot for Con Edison, oh, you got to switch over. Of course. And, you save, and if you give me $300 to sign up, then you get... The three hundred dollars for everybody. You, it's like oh. all those Ponzi schemes. Oh my god! All from the same a million calls. Yeah, they all from them. the same stuff. One hundred percent. So when you started doing the culinary school, you so, were still in Long Island, traveling to Manhattan. Or? No, so the culinary school was in um, Hyde Park, so it was in the Hudson Valley, okay. Okay. like Poughkeepsie. Okay. So I, um, you know, at this point, I'm like twenty two years old, a year removed, mm-hmm. and I was like, you know, Ma, the uh, the chef that I'm working for says I should go check out this school, that it's a really great school. And, you know, I, re- I want to go to college and get an education. Like, I don't, you know, at this point, like, I don't want to just wait tables and work as a prep cook at Child Baby the rest of my life. I could felt myself it was going down the wrong road, you know? And um, I was, like, hanging out with my friends, smoking blunts in parking lots till fucking, you know, 3 in the morning, waking up at 1 in the afternoon to go back to work, at, you know, too. It was a bad cycle, and I was... Bro, that's literally our lives. Like, I mean, this guy is literally, like... I think we all come from that um, that farm system and that shit, you know? Right, right, yeah. And it is, like, you know, those of us that, like, you know, felt ourselves in that position and felt like you wanted more, you had to do it yourself. Nobody was going to come give it to you, you know? Like, th- those talks in the car, smoking and shit, oh, it's hell like, yeah. when you really figure out, yo, this is what I'm going to do. Hell yeah. And then some people get stuck in that life where they're just stuck and that's all they do is waking up at one, go to sleep at three, you know, like it's funny you, you say that bro. because some of the biggest support I got from my friends was like having those conversations like, yo, you want me to go to culinary school? You think that's like crazy? Like, no, bro, go do it. Follow your dreams. That's sick. And I remember like smoking with my boys, having those kind of like exactly what you're saying. And a lot of that gave me the confidence to like do it. Like this is going to be the right move. So I sure enough, I went to go visit the school with my mother. I'm like, you might take a ride with me. And we went there. And, you know, for anybody that doesn't know the Culinary Institute, it's um, it's not far from Marist, right? So it's right on that strip. It's in beautiful Hudson Valley, like mm-hmm. the river's right there. But it's in an old seminary. And as we know, the Catholic Church has the best property in the world, right? Yeah. So it's literally the most beautiful campus I can imagine. And it's an old seminary with stained glass, these hidden little... St- you feel like you're in the fucking Vatican. It's so how sick. many years were you there? Four years? Because you said college. Yeah. So I, there's, there's a, there was like a three-year program and a four-year program. I went for the three-year program. And I was thinking about, you know, staying extra, but it was just like taking math classes for like to get your uh, bachelor's is the four years, right? So I just got my associates, but it was intense, you know. It was like going to a military school. You had to shave every day. You wore, you know, you wore your, your, your chef whites, which was, you know, clogs with the checkered pants that were like nylon. They weren't comfortable at all. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you had a neckerchief that you used to have to fucking tie, like a tie really tight, a chef's coat over that, and then your toque, right? The and, big hat. Yeah, the big hat, the tall toque, and your, your knife roll. And if you walked into class and you weren't shaved, they fucking send you home. And if you got sent home, you missed a class, you... If you miss three, you get... Yeah, yeah, you miss like... And then uh, it was even more strict there. I think it was if you miss one or two classes, you had to take the class over and you still paid for it. 
So they were, you know, if you weren't on your shit, you get steamrolled at that school. They're yeah. like more strict than the Yankees over there. <laughs> yeah, you got a mustache? Yeah. No. I'm, nothing. Nothing. At that time, there was no facial hair. And there wow. were kids that would get so nervous that they would go into the bathroom and shave with the, with their knife, with their chef knife. Oh, my God. Then they cut the cutlets with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's where the flavor, that's where the flavor uh, comes from. That's ski vibes, man. <laughs> so, so after school... Did you go to Roberta's right after? So school opened up my eyes. School was like a whole fucking, it was crazy. I, uh, it was like, I thought Italian food was like the be all and end all to like cuisines. Like I didn't think that there was another cuisine that was a, nearly as good as Italian. Like, and I really believed everybody in the world knew that, you know, <laughs> that I, like, I, I feel, I feel like you're talking about us right now. Uh, yeah. Because like, I, I didn't know shit about like, you have French cuisines. Yeah. It's got butter and. But I didn't even know what I was talking about. Oh, that's got some ego, man. Yeah. Oh my god. The best. The best. The best of everything, right? And I, I literally always felt like that. Like my grandmother used to say, like, "Oh, manco un presidente, manchada cosi." Like the president doesn't even eat as good as we do. Not know? even a not even the president could eat pasta puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> not even the president could eat, you know, the pasta quesad. Like literally, you know, we're eating this million plates on the peasant dishes. Peasant dishes, but the best, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's funny. When my father came to visit me. They were cooking asabuku at one of the restaurants on campus. And it was like $50 because there's serious restaurants on campus the students work on. And my father's like, in Sicily, uh, osabuco and risotto, they would feed that to the peasants. That was like <laughs> the worst cut of meat. Nobody wanted that. And now it's $50, you know what I mean, on the menu. But uh, it opened my eyes basically to like French food, um, Japanese food, you know, Asian culture, like Chinese, Korean. It's just... Is a wealth of spices and stuff. Oh, yes, yeah. everything like spices, techniques, like so much. Like you can't, you don't, you couldn't live a hundred lives and, and and learn it all. You know, it's really cool stuff. And uh, Mexico, you know, the Mexican cuisine is so similar to Italy, but it's so detailed. People think of tacos, but the mole is the different. I mean, it's just really fascinating stuff for me, and I became obsessed, and then. It was off to the races after that. Right. Um, I stuck around in Poughkeepsie working for a, a paisan of yours, Giacomo Breglia. That's right, yeah. He's one of my mentors, and he owned a pizzeria when I was in school. Everybody talks so highly about him in my town. He's he's a Sanchez legend, that guy. He's in, <laughs> him and Carlo. Carlo Sotero. Yeah, yeah. They all, they all talk about, uh, like, everything they do, you know? Like, a lot of them, when they go when they come here, they go see him. Uh, they're, they're amazing people, and when I was at school... Just for gas money, you know. Um, I worked at Giacomo's, and it eventually turned into such a close relationship that he's my partner now at Two Best Pizzas. One of them in New Paul's, and one of them in uh, American Dream in New Jersey. And uh, but they, their family took me in as family when I was at school. And a big thing that happened to me when I was there, which is kind of crazy, is that I was running. I opened the pizzeria with Giacomo. And I really wanted to get back to the city and get, start cooking back in restaurants, but I figured I'd make some money with him. Uh, I opened up a place on Route 9. I was working like six days a week, but I made money for the first time. I went out and bought a BMW brand new. I was going to a local gym, like 24-hour gym. It was like $20 a month, you know? And after work, I went to the gym. I was working out. It was like one day in October, and I came home. I was, wasn't living far from campus, like off campus. I was talking to my boy on the phone. I wasn't really paying attention. I got out of my car to get into my house. And I'm like, I felt like I got like a weird feeling. I look to my left, and I see a kid with a mask coming at me. I look this way, there's another kid with a mask. I turn like this, and a kid's got a gun in my fucking face. Like There's three kids. Three kids. Jesus Christ. Well, you Shit. knew it. I'm on my hands and knees with, with a, two knives to my neck like this. With a gun in my mouth ripping my pockets out, going through my whole car. Kids, like, pop the trunk. Pop the trunk. I'm like, pop the trunk. Like, you know, you want me to, I'm on my hands and knees over here. Pop the trunk. Fucking kid puts a gun in my face and gets get into the trunk. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, if I don't do something now, this might be a wrap. So I literally punch a kid in the face, and the kid slice me. <laughs> slice me from here to here, my whole fucking face, like, with a razor. And I'm fucking gushing blood. And I don't think, thank God the kid didn't shoot me. But he's like, shoot him, shoot this motherfucker, whatever. And 
My neighbors called the police. The police come with the dogs. Kids ran. They threw the knives. The dogs start chasing these kids through the, the uh, woods. Uh, woods to the projects because I live like a couple blocks away from the projects in Poughkeepsie. And they never caught the kids or nothing. But I was like sitting there like, fuck, like, this is in my neighborhood. These you think that was like kids. an inside job or something? Or some kids are just following you? I think like, you know, when I bought the the Benz, I was like, uh, or the, when I had the uh, the BMW, I was like, you know, kind of flossing in a neighborhood that wasn't mine. And I, it was weird because I said to my brother, I was like, a couple days before that, I was like, yo, bro, these kids are looking at me right, right here like I'm lunch in this neighborhood. Because I was pulling out one day and I saw the kid just like. The same kids? you remember? I don't know if it was the same kid or not. I wouldn't be surprised. Because they all had masks on and everything. But I just got that feeling, that gut feeling. Like, these kids are looking at me like lunch. Like, I better fucking be aware. And I called my brother and I said it. And literally a week later, I got robbed. And that's the only reason I left Poughkeepsie. Because I probably would have went into business with Giacomo then. Poughkeepsie is r- rough, that area. Yeah. When I was there, bro, it was hell. One of, one of my cooks, every week, a different like Mexican kid would come in beat up black guys because on Friday nights everybody knew the Mexican guys who were working so hard were getting paid cash they just they were just coming into the country a lot of Mexican immigrants were coming to Poughkeepsie at that time 2008 2009 and the kids in the neighborhood would rob them because they knew they wouldn't go to the cops after the bars they'd go out drinking yeah, after work so fucked up, man. rob them lump them up take all their cash from the week fucking got, kids would never go to the cops because they didn't want to get deported mm-hmm. and it was like Stick up kids were like making money hand over fist at that time. I never really didn't even cross my mind. I'm the only kid that moves from Brooklyn upstate and gets robbed. You know what I mean? Bro. Oh, <laughs> but, but that's real. That's real. That's real shit right there, man. Yeah, it was some real shit. I would have got the fuck out too, bro. Gun to your mouth. That's wild. Yeah, like, bro, yeah, yeah in the that's trunk. Just, like what the that's fuck? That's scary you shit, bro. That? Thank God, like. Yeah, yeah. I it worked out the way it did. You and know? I was fun. I was like really. That was, that was a blessing in disguise in a way that made you come to Brooklyn. Almost, now. it's crazy to say, but it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me, because I was like, it's time to go home, and I moved back to Bensonhurst to the block I grew up on. I lived on the block with my grandparents; they were still alive. I spent eight years with them, having dinner with them every day. Yeah. Amazing, you know? and I I got to I got to spend my adult life with my grandparents before they both passed. And it was, that was the best blessing that I've had. Inside. All the memories you made with them. All the memories. And then, like, when I was a little bit older, I, I had the sense to ask my grandfather all these questions that yeah. I always wanted to know. Like, what was it like for you growing up, you know? And he worked in the Voshka, like, tending to the sheep because they were shepherds, you know? And all these stories about, you know... Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. You know, Salvat- uh, Salvatore, Salvatore Giuliano. He was like um, in Sicily. He was like a bandit. Called him Toto Giuliano, the Sicilian. There's a book written about him. There's a there's a, a movie, and he was like my grandfather's hero. And all the kids in Sicily in that region used to read the books Toto Giuliano. What he used to do to the police. He used to, he hated the mafia. He hated the police. And he was like, I don't know. He was like just a stand up guy. You know. And there's a whole long story about what happened. You should look into it one day. Yeah. You're not talking about the comedian, Toto, right? Oh, no, no. Monopoly. Oh, this, yeah, this so is like one. in the 50s. This guy was on like the cover of Time magazine. He was, he was, he was a bandit, right? He was like um, the Robin Hood of Sicily. Robin Hood of Sicily. Oh, that's fire. Steal from the rich I, I and give look, to the poor. I gotta look into that. Yeah. So even now, if you go to Sicily, especially where he was from. Um, Monreale, uh, a town called Monreale. They have a beautiful church. You'll see books of uh, Toto Giuliano hanging on the wall. So I found out that was my grandfather's idol. And it's funny, Anthony Falco's father is also a painter, and he painted me this beautiful mural of Toto Giuliano because they're from Sicily. They're from Mamorale. Yeah. And it was, yeah, so things like that. I got to know about my family that I never, you know, that I never would have known otherwise. Yeah, no, that, that's special. And now, how did, like, your? because I remember you had uh, the show Advice for a long time. Yeah. Where did that come about in this time frame? So we opened Best Pizza in uh, 2010. And right away, like, I, I opened it with my two best friends from college. So I had really good cooks with me, you know. Kids that were also, their life was cooking. Um, wasn't just a job for them. It was their career. And we opened Best Pizza. And we really had it. We were really locked in, you know. 
We were working a lot of days, a lot of hours a day together. The food was coming out really good. And we started getting some recognition, you know. We started getting some press. We got a New York Times review that was really big for us. And um, so right around that time, uh, at the time, Vice's headquarters was on North 8th, right? So they did. Oh, not on the south side, because now they're over there on the now, south. Yeah, then they moved to that big, beautiful one on the south side. Yeah. But before that, they were in like a warehouse on North 8th. It was okay. dope. It was right, so you... This is on North 4th? Uh, on Between North 7th and North 8th. Oh, right, okay. Right by Mount Carmel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I always thought Mount Carmel was North 4th. Okay, so it's it was right down the block from your pizzeria. So, yes. So, the the Vice, like, original, um, you know, spot was right down the block from the pizzeria. So, all the producers would come in and eat. And I got to be friendly with, like, the producers and stuff. And then from there, it led to me uh, doing Chef's Night Out, which is one of their shows, and then to, to shooting a pilot for the BT show. And how was that whole experience having a TV show? Because it was huge for us. Like, I remember watching a bunch of episodes, and you did a, a lot of episodes in Italy. Yeah. So, I was how was with it? my grandmother, too. My yeah. grandmother, like, like cooked oh, cool, chicken cutlets. Yeah, yeah, she cool. made a chicken cutlets for you. Yeah. It was, it was like a dream come true, man. It was a dream come true. Like, as a kid, I used to say to myself, like, I wish the world could, like, experience, like, when we used to go to my grandmother's house, especially when we were driving in from Long Island, it would be like all of us would pile into the Astro Van, you know, five of us, drive to my to my block, you know, that we're from, park the car, you know, walk up the stoop to my grandmother's. Now, the second you open the door to get buzzed in, you could smell what she was cooking. Mm-hmm. The second you open the door, right? Mm-hmm. We would ring the buzzer, right? And my grandmother would be, Arrivamo, arrivamo, right? On the on the speaker. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you, they're here, they've arrived. And we opened the door, you know, walked down the hallway. Upstairs, my aunt lived. My grandmother lived in the back. But then if you went down to the basamento, you know, that, that, that fake Italian word that everybody uses. Basamento. Yeah, you know, I didn't even realize that was a fake word. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think any of us did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, garbage is a yeah, yeah. fake word. Chicken. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, sanatish. Sanatish. Uh, um, so we go down to the basement, and my grandmother would be there waiting for us just to shower us with kisses and the franges was there. Like you just, you know, it was like pure love. And then you walked into the, into the kitchen and the table was set with like everything and what's frying on the stove, what is on the table. And everybody would sit down and start eating and literally love and food. They started just, I don't think I realized it till I got a little older and really started putting more thought into everything, like not just surface thought, but like, why do I love food? Maybe it's because I associate it with my grandmother and how much I love her, you know? Yeah. And that really like That's I, special, man. Yeah, it hit it rang a bell. It was like, that's it. Like food is associated to love for me and happiness and like that warm feeling of family, you know. Definitely. Food is the Italian love language. I always say that. It's, it's like there's no better way to connect. It's a perfect family, way to say friends. It. Perfect and like, say. just picture a perfect Sunday. <laughs> Literally, no yeah, more amount so, of money. So it's so no real. mansion, none of that. Could yeah. I feel like I learned so much that. about you on this episode, bro. Yeah, it's bro. crazy. I talk a lot, bro. No, bro, bro, you're an interesting person. Yeah, bro. Yeah, I, 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 I feel like we could be going for hours and hours. What I wanted to say, this is what I said to our last guest too. What uh, I've learned from doing this show is a lot of people are gonna call you out to see if you're really Italian or not. Yeah. <laughs> so tell our viewers. Why you're Italian, or at least in your in your heart, why you feel proud to be Italian? Oh, the pride is crazy. The well, so I think for people like us, I, in America, there's a lot of levels of being Italian, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of Italians came here in the turn of the century, 1900s. You know, mm-hmm. so there's a lot of Italian Americans whose family they don't really have they don't have uh, any connection to the old country or to the town that their family's from. They just have an Italian last name, and they say crazy shit like regat and fucking, <laughs> you know, which drives me crazy. Is re, regotta, recooked, re c o t t a, regotta. It's very easy to say. Anyway, so for me, I think after thinking about this stuff, like I was saying, it's like have being in two worlds, like growing up in Brooklyn and you know being now here, part of this hipster culture and this the new restaurant, the cultural push that. Food has had the last 20 years. 
but also having a foot in like that old world, you know, and going back to the town. I know the house that my grandmother grew up in is down the block from the house that my grandfather grew up in. I know when my grandfather, he used to take the sheep, so he would flirt with my grandmother <laughs> out of the window because I would go and my paisans would well, show so me. That's so funny. You know? You walk with the sheep like, Zinyo. Yeah, exactly. It's yours, <laughs> baby. Yeah. This, <laughs> like, like, you know, yeah, literally. This is where your grandfather used to come to, to, you know, to hit on your grandmother and flirt. And I would just get goosebumps. And They don't make love like that anymore, bro. No, it's crazy, you know? And so I got to really know, like, both sides of my family, like, the history, you know, like, what their childhoods were like, what their houses were like, what they did growing up. And I think that I was able to make these really deep connections between, like, my culture and my family and who I am now. So I'm very proud to say that, like, I know my culture. Like, I know where my family's from, generations. I've walked through the cemetery in my father's town, and I've seen my forefathers, my great-grandfather, you know, his brothers on both sides. And it, it's a very strong sense of pride, like you said, mm-hmm. when you when you understand that stuff, you know, and you know the way they grew up. You know what they had to deal with, you know. What about getting the cosign for your pizza skills? Did the Italians give you that? While you were traveling, doing a show, going to Napoli, Rome, and your experiences with pizza, and some of your pizza's not exactly the most traditional. Like you put sesame seeds on the crust. I could see some Italians being like, this isn't real pizza. Well, you Can Napoli you... dance, forget about yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Even if you yeah. in Napoli, you know, and my brother, I, Napoli is one of my favorite cities in the world. I fucking love Napoli culture. I love the soccer team. Mm-hmm. Um, but Napoli dance is tough. If you say you're in the pizza business, they don't want to hear it. Yeah. Especially if you're from America. Yeah. They want to see, they want to know all the little fucking details. And if you're not making a Napoli pizza, it's not pizza to them. Yeah. It's, it's literally. Bro, it's so true. It is so true. And we've had this discussion so many times, but I really want to hear what you're going to tell us on your experiences. <laughs> You'll like this one. Um, once we started getting a little notoriety and, and I was doing the show, we got a visit. I got a call and they're like, um, Kudo is obviously the, 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 the flower. The flower, yeah. Right? So I heard anyone who's in the pizza business knows Caputo flour because it's pretty much the best flour um, that you could use. And they have all these different lines. If you want to make a New York style, uh, if you want to make Italian, the double zero, make pasta, the best, right? So I get a call that uh, Ultimo Caputo is in town and he wants to stop by Best Pizza. He was going to Roberta's and he wants to stop by Best Pizza. I was like having a heart attack. My mother comes and works with me one day a week, right? And she's, my Italian, I'm very insecure, but she's, her Italian's very good. So I was like, my, you got to come downstairs and talk to him. He's like, here from Italy, blah, blah, blah. So he came over and he gave me like a, a watch, like a pizza watch. Really nice. What's gave, a pizza watch? It's, it's, a, it's like a Caputo watch. It looks like a Swatch watch. Uh-huh. And it's got a bunch of pizzas on it. That's and he fire. gives it out to people when he goes to that pizzeria as like a little gesture, you know? You wear it out? No, I got yeah. it in there. I, don't, I can't tell time on those types of watches. Yeah. I mean, I'm in the fucking... It's pizza clock. Yeah. So how yeah. did it, how did it, like, how was your experience with her? So I gave him a couple slices and we sat down. I was like, how was everything? You lo-? He's like, ah, oh, it's great. Did you like it? He's like, yeah, I loved it. He goes, but this isn't pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so like, so I what, what is it then? I'm like, he's just like, it's, your, it's like flat. I don't right. know. He didn't even... Flatbread? Flatbread. He's just like, yeah, it's your, it's your guy's thing. But pizza is not this. Pizza is 250 grams, 100% Caputo. The, <laughs> you got to use the, the San Marzano tomatoes. You, yeah. have to, you know, I'm using all American ingredients, right? Like flour from Vermont. Oh, you don't use Caputo? I do use Caputo. I, I, I mix it with another American flour. I have some Italian ingredients. I shouldn't say all American. Yeah. But um, I tried to support local American businesses, like yeah. people that were doing artisanal stuff American. So, you know... Pizza in New York, we made pizza more famous than Italy almost in yeah. some ways, you know, yeah. not not always, but New York pizza is very popular. And besides your popular. pizza, what's your favorite style of pizza? Um, Lucali is my favorite pizza. I, I don't just say that because Mark is my good friend and because like famous people go there. I say it because I really love his pizza. So, like, if someone's never had Lucali's, how would you explain it? Because it's very unique. It's very it's unique. not New York style, and it's not. But everybody said I never had it. Everybody says it's the best. I had it in so Miami. I didn't have the one here, so it doesn't count a hundred percent. 
Because this that's the real one. Let's go. And we oh, talk about yeah, Mo, Mo tells us all the time we got to go. Yeah, I got you. But yeah, explain, explain yeah, it to us that we've never had it. He's great. Well, the first off, the restaurant itself is very charming. You know, there's um, beautiful girls that work there. And they're I all, don't. Yeah. All that neighbor, doesn't hurt. All neighborhood girls, too. You know, so it's like you really get to feel like you're in Brooklyn. Mark is a master of like, um, of like design and just getting an atmosphere. So the atmosphere is so Brooklyn, and old school, but classy. And then the pizza is, is just the best products that you could use. It's very organized and clean. A lot of the times he's making the pizza himself. And um, when it comes out, there's like a lot of basil on it. It's aromatic. It's crispy. The, the cheese, he uses a couple different cheese. So you get a lot of different like flavor notes. It's it's just very yeah, well. He, cu- he puts like a lot of basil. I see mm-hmm. like he pretty much cuts it off the stem right right on top of the pizza. The first and he puts the stem too, right? Sometimes. Yeah. The first time I met Mark, we were doing an event. This is like 2008. And he literally came into the event with basil in the pot, the whole plant. Mm-hmm. And I never saw a chef do that before. I actually bring the plant into the kitchen. You know, sometimes people do it with basil and stuff, but I, I had never seen it at that time. And he's picking the basil. And I'm like, this guy's on another level, you know? Yeah. And he didn't come from the restaurant world like me. He taught himself. So I was very always impressed by that and the way he went about it. I got to meet him at Carbone. He's a character. He's great. He's a really good guy. He's a great guy. Great person. So, Francesco, <laughs> what makes a good pizza? Uh, all right, I have a, I have a thought on this. If you guys haven't noticed, I have some very specific, you know, ideas and thoughts about pizza. But um, a lot of people, you know, love a lot of cheese, and when they do it with the mozzarella pull, right? Um, a lot of people will talk about sauce. They, some people love a sweet sauce. I like an acidic sauce. What I think makes a good pizza is is the ratio of those things, right? So, like, too much cheese, I think, is disgusting, right? It, like, makes me nauseous. But if you have the right amount of cheese and then you have the right amount of sauce, uh, you get to taste, and I I've, I say this a lot when I talk about pizza, but it's very important to me. The acidity from the tomato mixed with, like, a creaminess of a good mozzarella cheese is, like, that's the flavor that that I think what makes pizza the most popular food in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a similar thing where it's, like... Um, you know, uh, peaches and cream, let's say, right? Because a tomato is actually a fruit, right? Mm-hmm. So if you think of, like, the, that combination of uh, a, a acid and cream, you see it a lot. Well, in, in desserts, you see it a lot. In regular, uh, like, tomato sauce, you see it a lot. But the combination of acidic tomatoes and a creamy mozzarella is, is very important, and not too much of each, so one doesn't take over the other. And then a crust that's a savory crust and light. Not dense, you know. And to me, that's what makes it really. So the ratio of the three yes. is what makes it. Because yes. some people say, "Oh, it's all in the sauce." Some people yeah. say, "Oh, it's all in the dough." Some people think it's just all in the crust. You yeah, know? and I think the crust is very important. If you have a good dough, it, may, it goes a long way. Mm-hmm. But if all of those things have a marriage well, I think it makes a big difference. I will say this: I feel like I could have any dough, right? But if the sauce and cheese are mint, it'll taste good. But if it's a great dough and terrible sauce and cheese, I would not like it. Interesting, interesting. Is that a I, hot take or like? No, I agree. Fair? I agree. I think that's a very. I think, I think it also like the other way around though. If the if if the dough is like doughy or mushy, and uh, the sauce is acidic and and it's nice or however you like it, and the cheese is good, you'll still like it. Yeah, I think I'll sleep. I mean, yeah. not that I'll like love it, but but it's true, right? It's just like bread with if you know if you have bread with really good sauce and really good cheese, it's gonna taste. Yeah, it's good. like dunking a you know exactly. a scarpetta. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What about exactly? So your I feel your pizza specifically is, is known for the crust. Mm. You have the sesame seeds, super tasty. Does it drive you crazy when people don't eat the crust? It's funny to me because to me the crust is the best part, you know, but you know. That doesn't drive me as crazy. What you what used to drive me crazy, and it doesn't happen anymore because we change things around. It only happened for a very little while. When you give people a slice and they take the napkin and they put the napkin on top of the slice the and they pat it, it, they pat yeah. it to take the. So how did you stop? I that? think that's skivat. Well, so we were using a really great uh, uh, curd to make it, but the great curd had a lot of fat in it. So when you cooked it, a lot of the fat 
would come out and it caused a puddle of grease. So I actually had to use not as good as it was not as good as it curd. It's not that it's not as good. It's a little bit less fat inside of it. So when you made when we made the cheese and you reheated the slice, there wouldn't be a puddle of, of grease on top of it. It was a quick change. I got a follow up to that question. All right. Is a greasy pizza a bad pizza? Yes. If it's too greasy, because I feel like that oil. This is another thing for you guys, and I'm sure all you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is one thing that really stuck with me when I opened the pizzeria. In Italy, like one of the biggest things that they care about, they'll taste your pizza, but they care more about digestion, right? Like how you feel afterwards. Like, did it was it light? Is your stomach killing you? You know? And in America, nobody gives a shit about yeah, that. That's true. You that's know? True. So one of the most important things, and thank you for bringing up the dough, is that you know our dough we proof it. So basically, when you take a bite of the pizza, it's easier to chew, right? Because it's been proofing and it's, those proteins have been breaking down um, through like the fermentation process. And then when it gets into your stomach, it's easier on your gut. So digestion is a lot easier too, because most of that work is being done during the proofing process. So you know, like pizzerias that use a fresh, we got fresh dough. Nobody wants to eat fresh dough. That's like eating a, a bowl of glue, you know. So dough that sits and ferments is like for me you know, um, helps make a great pizza and thinking about how it makes you feel after you eat it, I think is really important too, because it might taste good going down, but then if, you know, you're back home fucking you're shitting, shitting on the bowl for fucking two <laughs> hours afterwards, nobody likes that feeling. So the grease is just from the fat of the cheese? Yes. yes. Okay. And I a feel lot like of, cheaper a lot of people cheeses. Use skin, like skin mozzarella, right? Or it's like, I forget, I, I've seen the... Yeah, you know what a lot of people do? Like, grande is like, grande, the, yeah. is like the best, you know? But it's very expensive. Yeah. So what a lot of people do is they say, yeah, we use grande, and they got grande in the fridge, and they got but they piccolo. mix it. Yeah, <laughs> but they mix it with, like, the shittiest, like, waxiest cheese out there. One way I tell, especially in New York, good pizza from bad pizza, if it's like a greasy-ass slice, especially if you have a beard or a mustache... You're going to smell pizza for the rest, the rest of the, of the day. day. The of the if day. it's a good place that uses good, clean cheese, you know, yep. it's everything's in order. You won't have that. Oh, 100%. I, I, 100%. Little things like that, you know, makes all the difference in the world. It's so right. funny. It, we could talk about pizza for forever. Everybody has an opinion on the best pizzerias. It's so personal. Bes besides best pizza, you said locales. Yeah. Is there any other... Honorable uh, mentions. We yes, to oh, absolutely. There's so many, man. I don't know where to begin. The Farrah's, you know, Dom is a legend. He Anybody who makes pizza in New York that, you know, doesn't uh, acknowledge him as an uh, inspiration, I think is full of shit. So, I never had the Farrah's either. That's another one I gotta go yeah, to. Yeah, it's worth it. It's yeah. And even though he passed, it's still worth it to go. The mm -hmm. Italian family, he did it right. He was the first one in New York to take that level of detail. Um, that, that pizza is phenomenal. Uh, I think that um, Lindustry in Williamsburg does a phenomenal job. I think that pizza the burrata really slice, good. the burrata slice. Yep, I think they're known for. Uh, there's there's a lot of pizzerias that are doing a good job. Sal Lucia Pizza on Avenue X. Yeah, he, he, he lives makes, nearby. He's a great, somewhere. he's a big friend. He used to he actually used to work at Best. Oh work really? At Best for a few yep for a little while. He makes fantastic pizza. Um, there's a, there's a lot a lot of good pizzerias. Yeah. What else um, do you want to plug in? Because I know we spoke about New Paltz, American Dream, obviously Williamsburg, Best Pizza. Mm -hmm. We just couple? opened a new spot on Grand, which is, it's a small location. It's not, Grand, not even... Grand Street right here? Yep, right here. It's okay. not even open a year. And um, I actually busted my leg. I got surgery, so I haven't been able to work on it the way I wanted to, but we have a beautiful backyard. It's amazing for parties. It's a small little place in the front. But in the back, it's like a garden. We have picnic tables. It's awesome. So it's a it's a perfect place to have a pizza party. We like it's very inexpensive to have a pizza party. It's a lot of fun. So you could do BYOB there because we don't have a liquor license. Nice. So uh, yeah, come visit Grand Street. It's a lot. It's a, it's a great place. And um, yeah, back to what you guys were saying about the pizza. Just one last thing about pizza is that for a long time in New York, if you walked into a pizzeria, you know you would just see kind of this pizza that. It's had this pale looking crust, you know, and the congealed cheese on top. And now, and I believe there is like a renaissance going on now. So many good people making pizza. 
that when when I what I look for in a good pizza or a good pizzeria is like I love to see you know bubbles and black spots and you know the white mozzarella yeah, yeah, but also yeah. the, the crispy mozzarella on there too and you know just the character of the bread that looks like a peasant bread rather than a, a pizza that was just looks perfect yeah it looks perfect or it was baked in like you know a, a low temperature gas oven it just has that same pale look to it you know the bubbles very underrated I bubbles agree. underrated very underrated I always <laughs> pick the slice of, thank you for saying that because I, I make a pizza a specific way, so it has a lot of bubbles. People always like, why don't you pop those? I'm like, because that's my favorite. A part. lot of, a lot of pizzerias now talking about Renaissance. Yeah, you go in, back in the day, you just pick the pizza, they warm it up, put it for you on a plate. Now, a lot of people warm it up, then they like do a little yeah, garnish They after. finish it, yeah. right? Like like you would see at a French yeah. restaurant. Yeah. You got guys at the pass fucking using microplanes, right in the cheese. Yeah. yeah. They're trying to do that with sandwiches now, too. My cuz relax. You know? Yeah, I know. We're, we're, I you know. know? We're slicing and throwing it on there. That's uh, it. Having an Italian hero like what we just ate here yeah. is one of my favorite fucking things in the world. The paninis here. And your father always has an espresso. No matter yeah, waiting for you. No man. matter when I come, there's always an espresso waiting for me. You need that. You need that. I mean, honestly, Such I, a class I appreciate act. you coming on our show because we've been talking about doing this for like two years. Yes. And timing is everything in life. And, yes. you know, the stories you told us today, like I learned a lot about you. And to all our listeners, make sure to follow Frank. We'll put your description and uh, Yeah, Best Pizza 33, yeah. Instagram. You know, you yeah. can find all the locations on, on that page. And... um. Yeah, man, it's a, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to see what you guys have been doing. I feel like this podcast, everybody knows it. Growing up Italian, like what you guys are doing for the culture, it's beautiful. And I think people need to hear more about, you know, the way that we grew up and what makes it so special. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, bro. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of memories for us, too. Yeah. It's, we could probably talk for 10 hours. Yeah, easily. Hours. We'll definitely bring you on again whenever you want to come Anytime, on. Anytime, man. And please come to the pizzeria. Yeah, I was going to bring absolutely. a bunch of pies. He said, don't you dare. Nah, nah, I'm feeding you guys we'll tonight. Yeah. I will. I want to bring pizza for you guys soon. Thank you, Absolutely. bro. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Frank. Pleasure is mine, man. Thank you very much, guys.